up or the courts or and not others or SSCCs are doing all of that stuff as well. Once they get to stage two, where they have the management of all the kids, the SSCCs are responsible for all of those things. All of it. So if you do not have drug testing resources within your area, the SSCC is responsible to find it, set it up, make it happen so that you have access to that service in your area. And I have one other question. What is ICPS under stage two? I, that's just an acronym. I'm, I'm uh, familiar with Cal and all that. Stuff, what, under stage two it says um, ICPS. I think that was supposed to say ICPC, ICPCS, which is basically out of state placement oh, assessment. Yes. It's interstate compact, compact placement service. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Compact placement. Can't wait for another day. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you. SSCC was being a court representative the child on the BFPS? Yes. <coughs> so once we get to stage two, so they so talk about Trinity and San Jacinto County, which are already kind of actively transitioning. So the spring, we'll say April 1st, when they get to stage two, it will no longer be a DFPS worker in court with us, it will be an SSCC worker. Between November 1st and April 1st, it might be a little mix of the two because it's going to be shared case management between the two providers. So right now, uh, the judge in the court can uh, require stipulations of DFPS on its court order. So I need to say, and SSCC required to do it in court order. Yes. Um, so the rest of the pros on the list the next one I haven't mentioned is that there is potentially more money at play, just in general, the sky's the limit when it comes to their budget too. So I put an example on here. So you guys, I think you've all heard the term CWAP, children without placement over the last couple of years, which has been a major problem in the state. Um, so right now, if DFPS needs to place a child, there are paid placements. So DFPS will pay a shelter for the cost of that bed in that shelter. Um, but those shelters have the option to say, no, we're not set up to take that child at that rate. It does, it's not worth it to us. So the SSCC has room to come back and say, okay, well, what if I tripled your pay? Would you take the child then? What if I multiplied it by five? Would you take the child then? The state cannot do that. Like their hands are tied to say, this is a state of regret. This is all I can pay you for this for placing this child. Um, same thing with the foster parent. If a foster parent says, I can't take more kids, the SSCC can say, well, would you, if I paid you triple <coughs> the rate to have this child housed for the next 30 days? So they have a little bit more room to make judgment calls, to bargain with whatever money they have at play, um, to be able to especially get kids that don't have placement out of a status of no placement uh, but to get creative about where those placements could potentially be. Um, the last two pros, um, community-based care areas are statistically performing better at achieving permanency within 12 to 18 months. So the data is supporting community-based care. We're going to lean into that and rely on the data supporting it. Um, and the efforts are specifically customized to lead to meet the local needs. So if you had an area that was just overrun with private foster homes, but didn't have any RTCs, from the state, there's a model that just says, we need to get more foster homes. And SSCC is gonna look at their area and say, but we don't need more foster homes. It does not serve us to put energy into recruiting more foster homes. We have too many foster homes and no RTCs. So they can shift their energy into saying what they're being told from the DFPS state office 
of where they need to focus their efforts to improve state numbers, to focus on what does this region need. And that goes right down into drug testing and counselors and psychiatrists and other specialists that our children need. That if, like we know for our area, especially region five, drug testing and drug rehabilitation resources will be essential for us. If you're looking at it from a state perspective, they may say, well, there's a ton of those in Harris County and Galveston County, and they're all around you, but in this new model, those don't matter. If they're not in Region 5, they don't count, and the SFCC needs to get them to Region 5 so that those families have access to the resources. Um, a couple of cons, which this is not going to be perfect and beautiful in every single way. Um, one is we can't expect there to be caseworker instability. Those of you that are already on cases in Trinity and Sanderson County are already experiencing this because they are in these active transition stages where caseworkers are saying, well, that's great, in six months I no longer have a job, so if I don't want to go work for the SSCC, then I need to go find a job right now. And so we have caseworkers that are saying, I don't want to go work for the SSCC, I want to keep my state benefits, I want to stay here with the state, and they're maybe relocating into different places. So in the last six months, we've kind of seen that shift happening in Trinity and St. Jacinto counties, and I think that y'all have felt that. Uh, where is my caseworker? Who the heck is my caseworker? It was someone else two days ago, and now it's someone else today. A lot of that is because of this transition of caseworkers are relocating to figure out what they want to do long term, and if they don't want to follow us over to the SSCC, then the state is in a position to keep dropping people into places that are going to fit. So the hope is that once we get to April 1st for Trinity and Sanderson County, it should level out. Um, there will probably be another little spike of people that come over with the SSCC and decide they don't like it there, and then they're gonna have to restabilize. But once we get to that April summer range for Trinity and Sanderson counties, that caseworker instability should level back out and then we're just working with this new provider. For Walker County, all the same stuff I just said, plus a year. Um, so we will probably, right around the time, Trinity and Santa Santa County start to <coughs> breathe and say, man, this <coughs> have a case for three straight months. Rose is gonna throw up her hand saying, I can't keep a caseworker to save my life. And that's just going to be part of the transition. Can this whole county in the same region or district as County is part of Region 5, um, but Region 5 got split up weird, kind of the same thing I was saying about Region 6, and I don't know if Polk County is with us. And it, were they in that meeting with us, House of Pines? Um, I think so. Oh, but that might have been lucky. I don't know. I'm not 100% sure. Mm -hmm. There were a couple of counties in Region 5 that got broken off to go with other adjacent contract providers. I think, I think they're split. Yeah, I think House of the Funds program got split. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, another con to expect, which this got brought up, is that there is going to be a change in our local offices. So right now we know we have an office in Trinity County. There's somewhat of an office in San Jacinto County. We definitely have offices in Walker County. So the SOCC will have the choice to decide where they want to put things. And I will say that for Texas Family Care Network, who is already the contractor that has signed on, they have said very much so that they do not intend to put satellite offices into the smaller counties because they want to save that money on overhead to provide programs and services for the kids. So their intention is that for Trinity County, for example, one of the smaller, more rural counties, is that they are going to reach out to potential partners in Trinity County to say, hey, church on the corner, would you be willing to provide a room for us for parent-child visits to happen here at your site? And how can we contract to coordinate that availability of service? So the things that we're using the offices for, it's still their responsibility to make options available, whether it's a daycare that can make a playground available to us, or a church or a business or whatever it may be, they still need to figure out where those gaps are filled. But um, Texas Family Care Network 
has said that all their staff is prepared to work remotely around wherever they need to go and that their main office is in Lufkin. They will be in Lufkin and they'll have a couple of offices but there will not be one in every county. Uh, the last one that is obvious as a con is just that this is new territory for us all. It's going to be new for everyone in this room. It's going to be new for our CPS workers that follow us over, that they're getting a new employer in six months. They're getting potentially a new boss, a whole new set of case workers, a whole new set of policies. Um, and so this is going to be a transition for all of us to relearn what are the rules that we're working with for SSCCs to give information down to us, help us to figure out um, what the transition means. So that brings me to the next one. To be successful, a few tips that I'm just going to throw out. One, do not expect perfection. There is no magic wand. If there was, we would have been done with this 10 years ago. Um, it's going to take time for us to make this transition. So just know that there are going to be kinks to work out. Things are going to go wrong. Just because an isolated incident is going very wrong does not mean community-based care is going very wrong. And we're going to keep a really optimistic attitude about what is ahead for us in community-based care. Um, the next one is we need to be communicating at all levels in all directions. So I mean, we need advocates communicating with supervisors, communicating with CASA leadership, we need advocates communicating with caseworkers, we need supervisors connecting with Texas Family Care Network leadership and talking about what the problems are, what's going well, what supports do we need, how can we communicate better. Um, once we get into the new year, there, like I mentioned before, there will be calendar dates set where me, Rachel, and Catherine will be meeting with Texas Family Care Network probably once a quarter to talk about what's going well, what's not going well. So let's just say that we have a meeting scheduled for March 1st, a month before we go into stage two. Catherine probably sent an email to all of her Trinity and San Jacinto people that says, hey, in two weeks we're meeting with Texas Family Care Network. I need for you guys to send me some feedback about how are things going. Are there caseworkers that you're still having difficulties with that are part of the SSCC? Are there policies you're not understanding? Are there things you're struggling with? What are you loving about this transition? And if we don't have that feedback from y'all, then it's hard for us to take it up to them. And so there may be some conversations that we have a meeting just like this, or maybe over Zoom that has Texas Family Care Network leadership right there with us, where they can answer the questions about what their intentions are, what their goals are. Um, but we will be doing the very best we can to facilitate lots of communication um, to make this transition as easy as we can. Uh, the third one, I'm going to just say, raise your hand if this is familiar to you. <laughs> Friendly, flexible, and full of grace. Anyone familiar? Some of you who've been up, here for a while better. <laughs> So y'all know that is from our pre-service training and what Janet has recommended that when we are working with CFPS, CPS staff, friendly, flexible, full of grace, that does not change as we do this transition. If anything, it grows. That we are here to support them, um, to empathize that they are also going through some really tough changes. Um, I couldn't imagine being told, hey, in six months, CASA will no longer be CASA. It's going to be Boys and Girls Club. No worries, you still have your job, but now you work towards a girls club. Congratulations. Um, that's a tough transition, and so we are going to walk beside them through that transition and help and support our kids as much as we can. Um, which leads us to the very last is we're going to optimistically embrace the opportunity for us at CASA to do what we do best. So this situation, this transition, will present lots of challenges for us. It will also present an opportunity for CASA to shine. That we have a whole set of kids in Trinity and San Jacinto counties that as of April 1st, 50% of them are probably getting a new caseworker. Maybe 60% of them, maybe 90% of them are getting a new caseworker. What they shouldn't be getting is a new CASA. 
in a year, we're going to be going to trial on cases with a caseworker that has only been on a case for three months. Hopefully, with a CASA that has been on the case for 18 months or two years. This, transitions like this, are exactly why we're here, why we do what we do, why we preach that we are the consistency for the children that we serve. Because the state of Texas is in flux. Foster care is in flux. And it is our job to keep showing up for our kids, keep showing up for our families, encouraging them, supporting them, and walking them through what is a hard transition on top of what is already a hard transition. Um, but in a year, it will be our judges leaning on us to say, nobody else in this room knows anything. Casa, please help me out. Tell me where this kid was two years ago. Because the SSCC just flat out isn't going to know. And that's just the reality of the transition. So I hope that you guys will lean into that and trust and believe that you are here at CASA for a reason and serving these kids and that you will continue to invest your 110, your 200% into the kids that you're assigned to because if they don't need us now, I do believe that they will need us more than ever as we go through this community-based care transition. Okay? All right. What other questions do y'all have on community-based care? I just want to understand that right now there is no contract awarded to anyone for Walker. Like Correct. That process is started yeah. It's open, but they can't tell us anything about if someone requested until they award the contract. Yes. Um, we have asked that question about two sets of rules that, hey, we're split region five, region six. Um, Texas Family Care Network has said that they are prepared, that they understand that's happening, and that they want to work with whatever SSCC Walker County contracts with to help ease that transition of let's see how many policies we can agree on so that we're not completely divided, but it's two organizations that are still gonna do their own thing, so it will be two sets of rules. It made your training into a holiday. <laughs> you know, we've talked about that, and our hope is that training won't change. Because at the end of the day, just like Lois asked, at the end of the day, we're still doing the same job. We're still visiting our kids, we're still doing medical advocacy. It's just changing the person we're calling to get the information that we need. And so the transition will change our job a little bit, but once we're fully transitioned, it should be essentially the same thing. We're just working with a nonprofit now instead of the state of Texas. Okay, y'all excited? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, if you're instead of yeah. To see a light? Yes. Yeah. We want to vote as part of that thing who gets the stage. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm going to go to the Rachel basically came to me and said, Do you think it's inappropriate if we uh, try to put our opinion in what <laughs> caseworkers they should and should not keep?
which they have to manage their own capacity. So, like, they just, like, part of that bidding process is to prove that they have the financial resources to take it on. So, if they don't have finances to do it, then they can't just go claim the whole state. Okay, it's going to be good. We're just going to walk through it together. And you know, in spring of 2025, <laughs> we'll throw a party when we're fully transitioned. Hey. <laughs> okay, um, next I want to do the cover this technology piece that's next on your agenda. And this will take much less time than community based care. Um, there's no handout related technology. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, so I know that in the last six months or so, there have been some technology changes that have happened within FASA, email addresses kind of having different expectations attached to them, people getting locked out of email accounts. So to back up just a little bit, I want to help y'all understand that, um, one, we do not want to do that to y'all. <laughs> we have been under directives from Texas CASA and from HHSC, Health and Human Services Commission, that came down to Texas CASA and said, we have to up the security requirements for data within the state of Texas. And so because we are funded by HHSC and under contract with HHSC that we're going to follow their rules, they sent down a whole list of new requirements about email encryption, file storage, email accounts, password changes, passwords on your computer. Um, there were probably 40 requirements that apply just to stack computers alone that we have to correct. And so it sent us on a mission to where we contracted with Anthem Technology in town, who is now our managed provider for all of our technology. So it is up to Anthem Technology to make sure that our email accounts are protected, that there's a firewall in place, that we're not having spam coming into our accounts, that we're not having malware, viruses, all the things. Um, and you're also not getting your account information breached. So with that, I had to send Anthem Technology the list of here's what HHSC wants from us, and I need you to help us follow it. And one of those things was mandatory password changes every 90 days. So if, <laughs> so if you're one of these people that has experienced, I just logged into my email account yesterday and now I'm locked out and I can't figure out how to get back in, please know that it's not, it's not Catherine sitting in her office saying, wow, Anita, lock. <laughs> it is that it probably expired somewhere from Anthem. Um, and we just have to, we have to have rotating passwords to meet that requirement. And so Anthony is going to go in periodically, and if someone has a password that hasn't changed within the period of time, then they're going to force a password change on that email account. So, um, Rosa, I know, is kind of working on a guide for those that get stuck in that password change authorization um, for both her and Kat to be able to support you guys and guide you through if you get stuck on, can't figure out how to change your password and get back in. Um, they'll also have it available for you to maybe have an at-home guide as a first step if, again, you're stuck and can't figure it out. But we're going to do the best we can to support y'all through that. I apologize. It just is what it is. We have, we're stuck in the middle of it, too, as staff. So uh, I know that there was about two weeks that almost the whole staff was locked out on their phone of their email and calendars. And they were just like, you know, it's just not worth it to me to figure it out. So, oh well, I guess self-care September, no calendar on my phone anymore. <laughs> um, so I wanted to mention that. I, I think your supervisors have sent you all emails about encrypting emails that within that new requirement, we're expected to encrypt emails that have secure content in them. So children's names, birthdays, medical records, Anything that would be considered private and confidential, we should be encrypting those emails. Does anyone know how to encrypt their email? <laughs> okay, so to secure those emails in the exchange, which 
I could use our H I C language and it's rough. So to secure the email in the waves in the sky where that email goes, all you need to do is in the subject of the email, you will use whichever your favorite of these four, four words is. Encrypt, secure, protect, or private. Any of those four words in the subject line will trigger an email encryption. So what that means is that when you send that email, the person receiving it on the other end is going to have to authorize that they are the correct recipient and they're going to have to author, they're going to have to verify their identity to get into that email. Do they verify it to you? No. How just to, not their identity, but they have to verify that they are the correct. So do you know have you ever had gotten an email from DFTS that you had to like go out and yeah. it gave you like a six digit code yeah. and you had to go back and enter that code mm -hmm. in your email? and then it let you open the email. So it's the same concept, it's just coming from us now. Now, if the email is exchanged between anyone in this room, you can put secure on the email, and it will be encrypted, but we do not have to have passwords to get into those emails. So if Lois, you send a court report to Kat, you're gonna put protect on the subject line, but Kat does not have to do anything special to get this email, because we're all part of the same email network. So this is only for our CPS workers, other professionals, people outside of the <coughs> office of WalkerCounty.org that are going to have to take the extra steps to get into those emails. Can you repeat those again? The four words? Yes. Encrypt, Encrypt, private, protect, secure. So I have a question. Uh -huh. um, so I use my normal email, my normal everyday email, and not the if you are sending confidential information, um, you need to be sending it from your CASA email address. And that just helps us make sure that those emails are going where they're supposed to be going. No one is intercepting it in the middle of the airwaves that send that email and stealing our kids' information. And that just goes in the subject line. Goes in the subject line. I'm guessing text messages don't do it. Yeah, text messages you need to just be sensitive about. So if you're okay. using, I mean, it's better to be using child initials. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you can still have the conversations. We're just not going to send first, last name, fourth things when we can avoid it. So with teachers, you're just gonna you're just gonna encrypt it. You'll just set so, secure. Okay. Here, okay. Email regarding okay. X child, and then they will have to don't put their name in the subject line. Right, right. But yeah, I, I, yeah. But yeah. so they will have to. I have to do initials because otherwise the teacher has no idea. Correct. Yeah, as long as it's encrypted using one of these four words, okay. then you're fine. Okay. And if it's an email that has no confidential content in it, so if the whole email is just hey, Rosa, I wanted to talk to you about the child that I'm serving. We ran into some problems at the doctor's office last week and I need to visit with you. Yeah. Okay. You don't have to do anything with that email because if someone in China intercepts that, they did not get any more information about anyone than they had before. Okay. So it's only when you're exchanging confidential stuff. Yeah. I have a question. Okay, good. In the news today, mentioned that, especially in East Texas, there's a big through the FBI knows that emails have to do with children and special like en entities, foster children, all those types of things that we all just, it was just announced today. So I thought that was pretty yeah. I mean, it's obviously a problem. Yeah. Uh, that's why HHSC is coming down so hard on making sure we're following the rules. But <coughs> do we also encrypt those emails we send to our um, um, if it has confidential information. Okay. If it's just general, I mean, your foster parent knows who you're talking about when you email them, so it's not like you're going to have their name or birth date in that email. So if it's just a... And their first name is fine. Yes. Okay. okay, so that's email encryption. Talk to your supervisors if you need more information on that. Uh, or me, I'm happy to help y'all through that. 
Um, two other quick things is because our emails are now supported by Anthem technology, if you have difficulty with your email account, you're locked out, some setting is wrong, it's not working, you can email from your personal account <laughs> Anthem technology directly to say, can you help me with the password on this account? So to do that, you will email support at anthemtech.net. All you'll do is say, this is my email address, my password expired, can you help me get back in? Um, support, at Anthem. support at anthemtech.net. Um, during business hours, when they, I mean, eight to five, Monday through Friday, their responses are usually minutes that they will hook you up, set you up, get you fixed. If you email on the weekend, then you have some people monitoring for emergencies over weekends, you may get a response, but for sure, if it is during the working day, you will get a response, usually within five to 10 minutes, for sure, um, especially if it's something simple like a password change. Optima is still ours. If you forget your Optima password, you still need to come see us at the office. Um, right now, Rachel and I both have direct access to change Optima password, so same thing. If you don't want to go through supervisors or whatever it may be, you're welcome to call or text me, Rachel. We can log in and take 30 seconds to change your password. So. Okay, the last one that I have on my list is Project Broadcast. Um, so raise your hand if you got a reminder yesterday, text message, saying to be here today. Most of you, if not all of you, should have gotten a text message from someone on staff. <laughs> um, that is coming through software called Project Broadcast. The only things I'm going to say about that, number one, is that's coming from a system where that allows us to text all of our advocates, board members, whatever group we need to reach out to at any given time. Um, that number does not belong to anybody. So if you reply to that message, it will not go to anybody's phone. So it may look like, it'll, my phone said, maybe from Rachel. And so I'm like, oh great, I can text Rachel back. We do have access to those messages, um, but we have to log in to the system to see those messages. So it might be four days later when we want to send another message out and we're like, oh, hey, Joanne has a question about her case. I should probably reach out to her about that. Um, so don't respond to those messages. And if you really want to earmark it, I would encourage you to save that phone number as CASA announcements, CASA office, um, just so that you know that it's not a person necessarily texting you, but it is a phone number that your phone identifies as, this is where CASA sends me messages from. Jean Marie did it yesterday. She never answered. And that's why we want to tell you this on a person, because we don't want you mad at Catherine and Rosa and Rachel for ignoring your text messages all the time, because they do care about you and want to respond to you. Um, they just don't speak